Away, welcome back. Deep South Connect, it's all about respect. We are back in Ocean View, and today we have another legend, an absolute pioneer of hip hop community building. This guy has taught me so much about life that it is unreal. I can't express my gratitude to this man enough for the countless blessings he has bestowed upon me. Give it up for the one and only Earl Mentor, my brother. My brother. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me, homeboy. It has been a pleasure to get to know you over the last 15 years. I think we met when we were kids. Yeah. On the school bus. Definitely. I think yeah. that was the first time I was staying in Zodiac Road, I think. And yeah. you were staying in Aquarius? Correct, yeah. But we only really got to know each other when we were growing up yeah. through Mzansi. And you were one of the best MCs oh, in God. the Deep South. <laughs> Can we go back to those early days? How did you get started in hip hop? and in community work and how did your journey start? You know, uh, look Dewey, thank you um, first of all for having me brother, it's an honor Pleasure and a privilege brother. Um, you know, I've been trying to unlearn um, my past negative conditioning, you know, and how I could come to terms with what I've dealt with in my past. And I used hip hop as a means of of healing um, myself and finding sensible ways to be more and do more in the context of joy and happiness and mm. hip hop literally saved my life. So music is a better part of me and I use music as a catalyst for positive change and there where hip hop started for me. That is fire my brother and mm. one of the things I loved about the way you did your hip hop was you always kept it humble. Even when you were killing it and you were selling mixtapes and you were doing shows, you always taught us to be humble. And this guy and I had a clash once because when I was younger, I was like, oh, I'm the shit. I want to battle anybody who want to battle me. And you came to me and you called me aside and you were like, nah, bruh, like we keep it humble, man. Even when we're doing our thing, even when we're flexing our skills, we keep it humble. And that's something that you've carried to this day. You still push that, whether it's with Mzansi when you were at Desmond Tutor Youth Center, now you're with Peace Jam, you're doing your own thing with Cape Flats Karma, and you always push that humility. Why is it important for people to understand that humility is so vital in everyday life? Oh, good question, bro. You know, um, we all are custodians for positive change and it's 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 important for us to to utilize our voice share our narrative in order to bring about positive change i always believed in that i'm passionate about leaders who lead where they are planted so if we speak about the high-risk communities that's overwhelmed by negative social ills it's our responsibility as young adults to lead the charge, to engage people positively, to show our people that there is another way. So we use our voice, we use our narrative in order to engage people positively. And that has been, been my driving force ever since. But I cannot please everybody. I'm not always humble. Speak a little bit about that. Um people having expectations and not being able to please everybody we, we we live in a polarized society brother you know you can never please everyone with your opinions your presence the words you utter where you show up you will always have the power of duality where people will be this side of the fence in terms of their opinion and you will have people on the other side of the fence so I just try and show up authentically in everything I do. I fail miserably, you know, because I'm still dealing with my past trauma. And it's a lifelong journey for me in terms of my healing. I'm going to make mistakes, 
I'm going to upset people. I'm going to have people that's not going to agree with my stance and what I speak and what I do. But I strongly believe that the mission is bigger than us all. The mission, when I speak about the mission, I speak about our purpose for being here, for doing what we do. And it's a learning experience for me. You know? So that's 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 my belief man. You know, I, I just continue, I keep my head down, I continue my quest. You know, I don't try and conform to the boxes that has been created and still, you know, um, yeah. um stubborn within our communities to try to use and um you know alternative way to show up. If that makes sense. Hundred percent. Thanks, bro. And I think that's what hip hop is as well. It's sure. trying to find an alternative way to express what you see. Yes, sir. So we take it back to the beginning. Yeah. So a quote that I've often heard you say is, and you said it earlier, hip hop literally saved your life. Now, as you've grown, you've gone into other avenues, you've written some books, which we'll talk about. You've done a lot of community development work through different NGOs. But if we talk specifically about hip hop, there's been a massive contribution made from Ocean View to South African hip hop. For sure. Massive. There are legendary MCs, legendary B boys, yes, legendary producers, all out of Ocean View. And a lot of them still to this day consider you such a legend, such a pioneer, and you still engage with all of them on a regular basis. So one of the things I kept, this was the this thing meant so much <laughs> to me, bro. This, do you remember this? I do, I do actually. So fire. So yeah. this was the very first poster that some of us were on. This is over 10 years ago. Mm. And yeah. The reason I kept this is because at the time it was such a big deal to us because you were already popping. You were like, yo, Nuzzle, like, yo, the guy. And then you asked some of the younger guys, like myself at the time, do you guys want to open for me at Purple Turtle? And on here you got like the O, oh, Four Corners, which was your crew. Young Terror. Brother, what can you say? Thank you for this, by the way. Thank you for providing opportunities for us when we were coming up. Do you know what I mean? Thank you I'm so humbled, much. bro. I'm humbled, you know. That we all have, have contributed to the foundation that has been set in terms of hip hop. Mm. You know, and, and just to use hip hop as a means of uniting particularly young adults that's at risk within our communities. It's a great achievement. So speak a little bit about, we talk about young adults at risk. A lot of them go a different way, a lot of them go this way. People go in their own lane and that's fine, each to their own. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about the MCs that you've seen come up since your generation? If we talk about Young Terror and then we had Penn Bruce and we've had MCs like Ace the Tong, Spinner Corp, Fractus, Plotstorff, Trigger, rest in peace. The way you see their journey, how they started as young cats and now they are pioneers in the game. They go on Good Hope FM, they shut the cypher down. They perform anywhere in Cape Town, they shut it down. They release music, it's fire. How do you see that? Because you've seen the growth. Some of us, like I haven't seen them from the very beginning. I've seen them from that time when I got back involved with you guys. But you've literally seen the seed planted and the fruit being, you know, produced. Or you've seen the fruit. How do you say it, bro? I can't even speak. I'm so nervous speaking to you. Nah, you come on, bro. I'm nice... only old, bro. I'm only old. Yeah, you know what I mean. No, for real. But yeah. do you know what I mean about Young Terror, yes, Four sir. Corners? How have you seen, how, or how have they inspired you? That's a better question. Let me firstly um, um, share with you this. There was one guy that saw my potential and planted the seed in my life and made me realize my worth and value in hip hop. And that is Trigger. Aiden Trigger Adams. May his soul rest in peace. And that literally is the custodian of hip hop in Ocean Mule. Mm -hmm. 
He saw my potential. He embraced me. He created a space for me to grow. And I've made the executive decision. I will carry this message forward. And jointly and collectively, Trigger and I, and a lot of other custodians in hip hop in Ocean View. And everyone played a part, not only me, not only Trigger. To make people realize that you can use part of the elements to change and transform your life. And that we still witness today. How people have used their voices against injustices. Used their voices against inequality. Used their voices against uniting a divided, partial community. And witnessing the young cats stepping up today, it's amazing. When you speak about lessons such as your Easter Tong, your Young Terrors, the first Afrikaans hip hop group birthed in Ocean View, the most talented and passionate group, still active today. It's amazing. And I think if we look back, um, back in the day, the seed that have been planted, they've nurtured their own seed. They've seen their own potential. Mm. They realize their own worth. Mm. And they nurtured their own seed. And the seed you see today have grown after its kind. Amazing, beautiful, Fire. and powerful, brother. Fire, my brother. Word. I love that you speak about Trigger so passionately yes, because he inspired so many yes, of us. Sir. And he, he was almost ahead of his time. Yes, sir. The way that he viewed life. Sure. And the ideas he had for the world. Beautiful soul, eh? Yeah. Beautiful soul. Speak a little bit about who else inspired you when you started. I know there's a lot of legends yeah. in Ocean View Hip Hop. I've heard about people like Bala and your homeboy. Um, what's the brother's name? The dancer. There's another. There's so many dancers. I wasn't as plugged into the dance scene until later on when we had um, Rockets crew, Crimson crew, yeah. guys like Loggy and Jody and Ansel, Tony. Yeah. But before that, there was Bala. There was. Can you you educate me? Who who were the pioneers with Trigger at that time when hip hop was starting? Not just from a rapping point of view, but from dancing. We've had OV spinners. We've had all kinds of elements yeah. that have been part of the same movement in a way, but yeah. also connected. And then 783 hip hop movement formed. But back to the original pioneers. Can you mention some custodians? Yeah, forgive me if I missed a few names, um, but what stands out for me and what inspired me at the time is the Christian hip hop group that was formed in Ocean View um, in the early 90s. And that was one of Trigger's uh, first groups that he was part of. And we're speaking about your Ashley and Cheslin Brandt, the, the Knickknack Stones. Everyone know about the Knickknack Stones. Um, your Julie Mayer, one of the most powerful vocalists in Ocean View. And they were a Christian group um, that was very dominant in the early 90s. And when, trend, uh, when just observing Trigger's advancement in the hip hop industry, he then attached himself to MIS, where another legend, Jeremy Kudis, is a phenomenal and powerful producer. Mm. He's based in Fishuk now at the moment, but very active in, in, mu in the music industry. And Jeremy Kudis is also one of the custodians that have inspired me. Now we're speaking about your Bernard Knights as well. You know what I mean? The up and coming producers in the early 90s, still active today. These are the people that, that have really set the bar, that, that laid, have laid down the foundation for us. You know, they've made it easier for us to enter into the door. You know, Bala. Bala have been one of the active hip hop dancers in Ocean View for, for a minute now. He is a gentleman that have engaged young adults to become one of that competitive groups that competed on a national level. And hats off to Bala uh, for, for, for bringing breakdance, the element of hip hop into Ocean View. So I, I would think that is the 
the gentlemen, the, the guys that I look up to up Respect. until today. It was Cisco, the name that no, I, man. the name that was losing me. Yeah. I mean that I was forgetting. So okay, Vala, Cisco, these guys trigger such legends. Yeah. I'm so glad we're paying homage. I think it's yes, important to pay homage and respect to the people who paved the way, as you said, the foundation yes. for us to build to what we have till this point. Now, one of the other things that we've been so heavily involved in together is the NGO work we've done. Yeah. So you've been involved in a lot of organizations, Harlequin Foundation with the Mzansi Project. Yeah. That was where we reconnected and sure. really tried to do a lot of positive work through hip hop yeah. and through music. Can you speak a little bit about Mzansi, your journey there? Definitely. Um, I've, you know, I, I've had a permanent job with, with City of Cape Town, a, lit, a, a, a government job. Wasn't quite happy there um, until I, I've been offered the opportunity to. to to be employed by the Harlequin Foundation to head up the music um, um, department. And what have added value to my life is the model that they created that I still adapt and initiate within my, my work. The intercultural collaboration. The importance of breaking down cultural barriers. Mm. And at the time, that shifted me in the right direction. Um, it helped me expand my vision for a united Far South Peninsula. And my experience and my time working under the auspices of, of Hollycorn Foundation at the time really made me see the world in a different light. And, it, and I, I'm still fortunate enough to be part of that energy and still aligned with people that has been actively involved in the Inzanti project yesteryear in the past and still you know implementing what they have experienced back in the day respect to that respect bro and then you went to from Inzanti you went to make a big contribution at Desmond Tutu Youth Center as well yes sir and from there you started Fruit Nation yes sir which was your own organization correct which also had a big impact then you were contacted by Peace Jam. Yes, sir. Now, Peace Jam is another thing you pulled me into, yeah. which I'm so grateful to you for all these things you've done for me. Oh, thanks. And I want to make versa, that clear. Bro. This guy has done so much for me and taught, versa. taught me so much. Peace Jam was one of the things that really changed my life. Mzansi, of sure. course. Mzansi was a massive, one of the biggest parts of my life was Mzansi because we did it for over 10 years. Yes. But Peace Jam was so unique, not just because you're getting on stage with Nobel Prize winners and there's some hype, it's about the energy, yeah. the energy the participants bring, yes, sir. 400 people all coming there, not sure what's about to happen, feeling a little bit anxious in the beginning, maybe a little bit of nerves, a little bit of excitement, and then when the Peace Jam conference kicks off, Yo, you feel that, you know what I'm talking about, bro? that energy is so real and it's, it's almost overwhelming, but it's not overwhelming because it just feels so right and it feels so beautiful. Talk about Peace Jam, what it means to you, how you got involved, just tell us a little bit about your journey with Peace Jam if you would. Yo, thank you for highlighting that, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be the South African Affiliate Coordinator for the Peace Jam Foundation and the Peace Jam Foundation is based in Denver, Colorado in the USA and you know I've been amplifying the work and legacy of Desmond Tutu for a number of years I've been in the peace building industry for a number of years and for me to be offered the opportunity to be a representative of Peace Jam it's a life-changing experience so my involvement in, in PGM at this time it's just amplifying the work and legacy of Nobel Peace Laureates who pass on their skills, their wisdom and their spirit they embody in order to mentor young adults to be the change they want to see. Yeah. Much needed in our communities. 
I'm not um, overshadowing all the other phenomenal organizations, community organizations and projects in our communities that's doing phenomenal work. And I don't want to sound biased, but personally, PGM, it's an opportunity to amplify youth-led, community-engaged and Nobel-guided initiatives. The only organization in the world that's guided by Nobel Peace Laureates. So I'm fortunate enough, a young man from the ghetto, to be able to use this award-winning module to bring it into our ghettos in order to transform lives and give youth the opportunity to lead, to step onto platforms in order for them to amplify their voices. So that's where I'm at. Much love, brother. Much love, bro. That's so fire. Yeah. I love the fact that there's emphasis on youth. Because yes, I feel like the youth need to get as much encouragement, praise, and guidance as possible. We know what it's like to make mistakes when yeah. we're young. Yeah. Especially as young men. Yeah. You know, we know how society has conditioned us. Yeah. Of course, we have to stand for our own trip. Yeah. But speak a little bit about youth because every every organization you've been involved in i feel like the emphasis has always been on the youth and you speak about youth at risk especially in the high risk communities where they're even more at risk can you speak a little bit about youth and how you see the youth currently where the youth are currently at we're living in an age of social media we're living in an age where we're not taught about the correct foods to eat we're overly eating sugar we're constantly stimulated by our phones. How do you see the youth of today and where they're currently at? You know, it's been my lifelong mission, Luke. It's been my lifelong mission to reclaim youth at risk. To, uh, what I mean by that um, is that we need to facilitate safe spaces in order for our youth with, uh, residing within our Irish communities to have a sense of belonging to practice generosity, to, to practice mastery, to use their passion and talents in order to bring about positive change. And we also need to amplify the importance of independence because we still have an old mentality an old system that's becoming obsolete within our communities still trying to negatively condition our young youth that's active today to be a certain way and to do certain things in a certain way <coughs> it's the reason why the vast majority of our young youth in our communities are frustrated detached disconnected because they cannot relies your worth and value hence the reason why we're so distracted mm. from so many things that we feel that the false sense of self the false illusion when we we speak about social media how you need to react and respond to social media uh, when we speak about the movies we watch you know that we create a certain illusion that this is the way things should be and when we when we look at our community social ills the activities the negativity the conflict the self hate the violence the competition I, the vast majority of a young youth and this is merely my opinion based on my experience being actively involved in the social and personal development industry is that they use these energies and they create this a world for themselves and that's how they respond to people places and things based on the, the false reality they have created for themselves so we are trying to look at an alternative because there's three sides to a coin not two sides we need to stand on the edge of the coin in order to understand both sides. Ooh. So compassion and empathy, compassion and empathy is what we need to facilitate. 
and we need to understand about hurting people hurt people brother we need to understand the narrative behind a hurting young man that's going out and hurting others we need to understand the frustration we need to understand the seed of utility that was planted let's go back to our parents the trauma that's still unresolved untouched and how parents have raised us with their own trauma but they raised us the best way they knew how so we need to disrupt the narrative mm. that's dominant still mm. that keeps us limited in our growth and start with our youth respect you know yeah and that's where we where we are on yeah that is yo, that is fire bro now yo yo so much fire thanks man um i want to talk is cheap eh? <laughs> talk is cheap but you are all about action you I try bro you don't just talk you are about action come please everyone bro i'm not judy about you come be two places at once <laughs> you know it's only one of me i need to heal you know i feel so, you i feel you got always be active like i used to but still you are i mean i see you as active let's talk about as a nice transition from what you've just said because there's so much wisdom in there what you are doing with cape flats karma is essentially addressing a lot of the problems that you just mentioned and a lot of the trauma yes, so so cape flats karma is firstly this guy's written a series of beautiful books um got one here just to show you guys cape flats karma This is just one of many, eh? You've written how many books now? Actually, three books. Three books. I'm about to launch my fourth one. You're about to launch. When does yeah. your fourth book come out? You know? uh, I I do not have a date as yet, so. But people can follow you on the Cape Flats Karma yes, page. So, tell us a little bit more before we go into what you're currently busy with. Tell us how Cape Flats Karma started and what what is it all about for people who've not heard of it. No, I'm a firm believer in karma. uh what you show you reap you know um when you speak about i like speaking about the condition because I, i feel that plays a major role in the results we see today in our communities conditioning what we've seen what we've experienced when to go sit somewhere when i speak about the reality that we've created for our lives the false illusion of self the self hate based on having been exposed to so much negativity and violence and trauma in our lives when to go sit somewhere so when i speak about karma i speak about sow and reap i speak about the seed that we plant in our lives that we nurture you know that we keep dear now let me break it down for you even further what we think about ourselves is how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about ourselves we inevitably going to act up yeah bro so what we sow we reap so until we unlearn our negative conditioning that went to go sit somewhere because it layers upon layers of things that we need to lift so let me make another example a silk cloth beautiful silk cloth if i throw a silk cloth over a bed of thorns thorns scattered about i throw the silk cloth over a bed of thorns and i have a choice whether or not i need to forcefully rip that silk cloth off from the bed of thorns or take my time to pick it off so we don't damage so what now this is the duality if i forcefully rip that silk cloth of the bed of thorns what happens to the soul cloth a shreds shreds so that's an analogy that i use in all my work we are born to be great we are powerful resilient passionate human beings so when we were babies we were waiting to be molded and waiting to be molded by our first love and who's our first love a parent appearance right and for a baby waiting to be molded a baby cannot reject what the baby's been told 
right? And when a baby grows older, the baby still observe the world around him. And if the world is negative, and the world is traumatic, versus the world that is the opposite of that. Yeah, yeah. So, the hurt, the pain, the negativity, the trauma that that baby had, had experienced in his lifetime went to go sit somewhere. It was not addressed. It was not managed. Now that young baby is an adult, and that young baby is sowing the fruit of utility that was planted when that baby was a baby within the environment we are living in. And the conditions that are strict. Yeah, brother. So it's transforming that. It's speaking my narrative, speaking the truth based on my observation, seeing the hurt and despair in my parents, speaking that, in speaking truth to power. This is the truth, man. This is the situation right now. And I speak about the solutions as well. But I don't have all the answers. I do not have all the answers. I learn from people such as yourself. Unknown Kuru, JP, people that are, are really looking at alternative ways to rise above the mm. circumstances mm. and inspiring people along the way. I think that's our ultimate mission as custodians for positive change, my man. I see people looking at alternatives. I think of Ace the Tongue. He's got so much wisdom. Yeah. He knows about farming. He Work. sees how we're dependent on supply chains. Quite. I think about Plof stuff. He started King Size Studios. You mentioned JP. JP was in King Size Studios last week laying down some fire. Yeah. So people are within our communities making these changes. And although there is still a lot of trauma and a lot of hurt, there is a lot of positivity. Going back to the trauma, I'm just going to state it like it is. I feel like we are still living in the architecture of apartheid. Yes, sir. Would no you, doubt. Would you agree with that? I agree with you fully. Now, when we try and engage in conversations about this, I've noticed that there's a lot of young white people who are scared to engage in this conversation because they feel like People are going to jump on them. People are going to say, you didn't work for that, even if they have worked hard to get to where they are. People are nervous that anything might happen, things might pop off. Wait. How do you see, and how do you see that process? And what would you say to young people who are scared to engage in these conversations? Because I think it's so important that we speak about this stuff in order to, as you say, slowly pull that silk off the thorns and not just rip it off? Good question, my man. When I speak about my agreement with you with regards to we still living in a system that perpetuates the system of apartheid. Look at our apartheid relic structures still dominant in our communities. Relic structures, psychological and physical structures you will see. The congestion, the way things are planned out in order for us to move around. So, let me make an example. I facilitated one workshop, an intercultural workshop at one Model C school. I'm not going to mention the name. And this Model C school, you know, a lot of our parents could never afford, they still wish for the day that they can send the kids to 20,000, 30,000 rand a month school right and there was one um incident where a young white kid stood up um and he questioned this just based on his conditioning and he said this our parents taught us my parents taught me that white is superior that the white race is superior and everything else is secondary. Right? And that got me thinking, we still have a long way to go to overcome stereotypes, 
to understand identity and difference, to understand and discuss privilege and power that's still mm. perpetuating the cycle of segregation, particularly in this valley. And we need to discuss and understand the difference between peace and violence. Peace and violence. But when you speak about peace and violence, what happens when peace and violence come together and interconnect? What happens? So just based on your question, it's not only the white young kids that's afraid to step in, it's the parents. It's how the parents have, not all parents, because we see some white parents really stepping into the role and showing solidarity, but not enough. Not much actively involved in the really showing up authentically. But when you speak about the role of white parents in this valley, how they still need to learn and be educated of how to show compassion and empathy when it comes to addressing the inequality that's still dominant in this valley. Mm. How they need to start forcing themselves to come out of the bubble. Until they can learn, the kids will be conditioned to see life in a different way. And they will be motivated and inspired to integrate with us. So it's the parents, I believe, that feels they need to keep the kids in bubbles in this valley. I feel you, my brother. And what role do you feel business because there's a lot of businesses in the deep south. We've got some of the big corporate companies. We also have a lot of local entrepreneurs. What role do you feel businesses can play in not only who they employ, but how they empower people that they employ? How do you take the people that work with you to the next level? Yeah. You know, I appreciate the businesses that's actively involved in this valley that's offering an opportunity for those from the community to have a job and put food on the table. At one aspect of it. The flip side to it, um, there's still this belief that it's profit over people. It's first profit. Then people, maybe, because I'm offering you a job so you will do what I say and, and you know, dangling the carrot still happening and planet would come lost profit planet profit people planet so businesses play need to play a major role within the workplace to amplify the need for equality i still don't see a white man packing groceries at the toll Mm. At shop right to pick and pay my man. Mm. Not that I'm saying that, you know, but I'm just telling you. It's an observation. It's an observation. I see a lot of um, um, white people still very much in powerful positions. And us brilliant people still having to add value to their advancement, where else we need to work, pay bills and die. You feel me, my man? Mm. I still see a domestic worker from our communities having to hike mm -hmm. to get to a place that were forcefully removed in the same area. How traumatic is that? And is that being addressed? That's a question. That's a burning question and having to hike home. I'm still seeing our people still waking up in the dark, having to navigate through dangerous territories in their lives, get to work, come home in the night exhausted and not have an opportunity to engage with the kids because of what they have had to deal with in the workplace and how they are undermined and not respected not all of them I don't I'm not saying all businesses but I think we need to have the conversation but there's too much negativity there's a way out I think it's up to us as well to support businesses that we see as being real and to support the businesses that are making the changes yeah. and allowing for equality to be more yes, of a thing that happens. Yes, we need more equality, we need more power to be shared. This thing of centralized power is an old concept that has gotten the world to where we are today. And the way to get rid of centralized power is to just support 
this way. We don't need to always, some things we do need to fight against. But there's certain things I believe we don't need to fight against. Such as where we spend our money. Just stop spending your money there. Spend your money here. Support your local farmers. Support your local entrepreneurs. Support the people who are making things within your community before you go and get an account at Sports Scene or Air Gizzle. And I'm not even hating on those businesses. I'm just making a point. Yeah. So, brother. I contradict myself all the time, brother. Bruh. It's, you know, it's, I'm it's, not perfect and what I utter might not be what I do. And I, I'm, I want to make that um, uh, a point. Because I'm going, going to disappoint a lot of people. I still buy my stuff. You know, I'm still conforming to a certain way. And when I speak about businesses that need to play a role in facilitating um, racial equity work within the workplace, because we still see, when you, I'm, I'm not sure if you experience this and witness this, shop right, checkers, when tea time, lunch time, you still have a certain race group together. Where else is it? Do you see that pockets? Mm -hmm. Still happening. How is that being addressed within our workplaces where 90% of a contact happened? When you speak about schools, still pockets of racial groups. Where's the integration? Where's using education as a means of breaking down barriers? Why isn't businesses and our school system making it a point to address the racial inequality and the racial issues within the institutions? Why are we just moving along life, just accepting everything that comes our way and responding to things that we conform to? Do you feel like that might be orchestrated, you know, divide yes. and conquer? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, because we won't rise as a people if we are disconnected. Mm -hmm. If we separate it. There's an underlying agenda, brother. And it's up to us to start being consistent in our quest. To speak up, to speak to win. Even though our own will hate us. Because that's the duality of the situation. So when you mention our own will hate us can you speak a little bit about that you don't have to go too much into it but i think it is important for people to also understand that within your own community you've got people who are against you definitely then you have to go with that energy out of this community which was a f exists as a result of forced removals yeah. now your own people sometimes are against you now you have to go into the more privileged areas to get something done yeah. how, how does that how does that feel and how, how can people who are younger than you who are trying to also go on a positive lane how can they deal with that how do you deal with it and what advice would you have for someone dealing with their own people hating on them when they are trying to actually change those people's lives for the better as well no. good question brother you know i've been in um in this this work for a very long time social development and personal um, development and there is an underlying truth that we, we, we know it's there it's the elephant in the room and that's our self-hate what I came to realize in my years of being actively involved in, in knowing myself because I still don't know myself because there would be moments where I'm unconscious and I will react irrationally and after that, I will realize, damn, I could have responded better. What I'm saying is that the self hate that, that's still dominant within our communities are engineered for us to hate ourselves first. And when we hate ourselves, we hate the people that look like us. No. It's, that, it, it, it's a magnetic process. It's been proven, scientifically proven. What you attract, it's what you feel most of the time and I will make uh, make an example when you speak about self hate and um, based on my personal experience and just to track back what I had shared you can never please everyone you can never please everyone because we want to paint everyone with the same brush right when it comes to stereotypes perception you know how people dress, how people speak, how people act. 
and we already have a script for that person's life now. We have a script for the drug addicts in, the, um, uh, in this community, we have a script for the alcoholics. We have a, um, a script for the sexual offenders, we have a script for, for trauma, you know, scripts based on our perception and understanding on things. Until we understand why hurting people hurt people. Until we create spaces where people can really be authentic in terms of the narrative. And understand that grown men need to cry. The toxic mas masculinity within our communities. The cultural belief that men need to be the head. The dominance of men in our society that leads to the vast majority of men committing the crime. Men doing the shooting. Men doing the hurting. Men doing the killing. So what are we doing to, to raise powerful and resilient young men and boys in our communities? But we're going against the giant, right? The giant, the cultural belief that has been conditioned for years back. Now going against that, speaking against that, you will inevitably be ridiculed. Right? So let me break it down more. Why I will still be hated for what I say and what I do? It's because of that force that we go in against. The stubborn belief system, the ego, the pride. Why I will be hated in the work I do? It's okay. It's okay. Because I understand that hurting people hurt people and I understand and I realize my worth and value. I start loving myself again. Now I know how to respond to the enemy outside. But what is important is that I love myself. And no enemy outside can harm me. Because it's all about compassion and empathy, it's understanding somebody's story and embracing that energy yeah, and brother. using that. Yes, I will be hated, brother, but that's okay. Doesn't um, have me lose sleep in the night. So with compassion and empathy comes forgiveness as well. So hard thing, brother. Can we talk a little bit about the importance of forgiveness? In a community like Ocean View, but not just Ocean View, but because that's your community and you've seen so much trauma, you've seen a lot of crime, especially committed by men, as you say. But how are we as society going to deal with people who have wronged us? We can't just throw them to the side. How important is forgiveness as part of that process and welcoming people who actively want to change themselves to be better people? How can we embrace them and bring them back into society to make a valuable contribution to it? You know, that's, that's, that's a powerful question, man. Look, Personally, um, I struggle with forgiveness myself even though I try to be the custodian for positive change in myself and others. Forgiveness is one of the things that we need to really amplify. But it's a journey. When I speak about the seed, the things that we unconsciously, um, unconsciously picked up and put in compartments in our life, and think by any event or negative any event in our life, we look for that compartment, we pull it out, we use that um, survival um, script, close it and we use it in order to protect ourselves. We're always trying to protect ourselves all the time, right? And we're waiting, we're waiting, we're anxiously waiting for something to happen in order for us to kick into survival mode, mm. which often, um, often um, is dangerous. So until we learn about and forgive our past, our past, what we've done, what we said, I think um, um, that gives us 
the opportunity to forgive those that have hurt us, to understand, to constantly remind ourselves why that person has acted in a certain way towards me. What have I said? Is it because of that person's trauma, my trauma, that have brought the conflict um, 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 situation to the forefront? You know, it's all that aspects that that adds to the holistic um, learning process to start forgiving ourselves first and forgiving others. It's hard, it's complex. It's easy to tell somebody to, to forgive. But do we understand that there's still that remembrance of energies or things of the past that we don't show to the world only raise its ugly head when we are triggered negatively. Mm. So our jails, our prisons have men and women that have just been triggered based on the trauma that was unresolved and un un untold. That went to commit something based on that. And now sitting in jail for Until we get to the surface of our hurt, despair and pain. We say enough is enough. I'm not going to take any more abuse. I'm going to stand in my power. I'm going to speak to him. And I'm going to do what's right in my life. First. And you extend and you, and you expand your circle of influence. Starts with you. Change starts with us and I'm a firm believer. Yo, respect my brother. Thanks bro. Let's but talk, talk is cheap. Talk is cheap. <laughs> and in saying talk is cheap, let's talk a little bit about, we've spoken about toxic masculinity within the community. Let's talk about the ladies, brother. There's been a lot of ladies that have inspired us. I think of Cindy, I think of Sam, I think of Althea, I think of Shona, and YYs. I think of the younger generation like Alia, who I met through you guys. How important, and I think of your sister who was part of Four Corners back in the day. How important have, la have the ladies been in not only challenging that toxic masculinity, but just showing a different form of expression yeah. through their own creativity. Yo, good question, brother. I, I cannot speak on behalf of women because... Uh, you for know, sure, for sure, you for know, sure. But I mean more how they've inspired you and how sure. you see that. You know, um, I think there's a generation of, of young women rising up becoming consciously aware of a system that have kept them subordinate for hundreds of years. And they they rising up against that and that's beautiful to observe. You know, I'm a firm believer and this is my drive that women birth a community, birth a nation. Right. And for women to take back their power it's of utmost importance. Within our homes, the input, the resilience, the passion, the unconditional love that women have, that most men don't, needs to be admired and respected. Sometimes we tend to forget me personally. Um, sometimes my ego kicks in. The cultural belief of how men should be and react to certain things that kicks in. And sometimes I need to backtrack when that arises. Woman is the pillar of society, man. you know. And to speak in, into the power of what women portray. I want to be consistent in terms of what I amplify and what I do, you know, but it takes that unlearning to really be consistent in my approach, but that's what I believe, strongly believe and that, that's my drive. Fire, my brother. And woman needs to need to need to get more into leadership roles in our community. I agree with that because what I've noticed is that the mothers 
of Ocean View yes. are the real custodians yes, sir. of the community. Yes, sir. Yo, bra. When I track back and I observed and been, um, just, you know, um, a community development worker for many years, behind closed doors is still men on, um, on the panel making decisions. Old men making decisions. Our churches. Men. Our institutions. Men. Until we have the balance of power, I think our um, positive change will, will happen and we will start gaining momentum. Women are the real custodians in our communities. Fire, my brother. Fire, bro. Fire, bro. Fire. I love the way you speak so passionately. Passionately, bro. About your community, about the way you see the world. Now, in the Deep South, with what we're doing with Deep South Connect, is really just trying to connect the people. Respect to you, my respect, brother. Uh, respect to you guys, you know, you're playing your part. Shut, brother. That's that. that matters a lot to me. So we really just want to connect dots, you know what I mean? Connect Ocean View to each other, connect Fishhook to yeah. each other, connect Ocean View to Fishhook, to Red Hill, to Massey, to Simonstown, connect the Deep South to the rest of Cape Town, yeah. to the rest of South Africa. What do you have to say, not just to people of Ocean View, but the whole Deep South, about how we can come together through positive energy, to make positive change, mm -hmm. to really unite this beautiful valley because bro, we live in the most beautiful place. Yes. If you stand True. at the top of Lapland True. and you look over, you've got the best views True. in the deep south. True. So true. You know, what I love with the, uh, the energies you guys are running with now, and I love the concept Deep South Connect. We've been doing this for a very long time. And this module has been adapted by so many. But to be consistently part of, of, of the concept of connection, the concept of breaking down of cultural barriers, to break the stubborn belief system that we are this side of the fence and you're on that side of the fence. To break the stubborn belief system that you are a certain race or you are a certain way. All I can say, brother, and this had been my lifelong mission and I'm so glad and happy that you guys are running with this, that we need to start Embracing our differences. Mm. Mm. Embracing our differences, understanding what identity means. Because many of us, and I speak about my experience and my personal experience as well, that our identity is infused in trauma. And it's hard for us to navigate through challenges most of the time. But that's for another day. Please, please, I urge and encourage you guys to continue your quest. Get particularly the white people, the white communities, the young white adults involved in your mission. To start seeing a different world and understanding in order for us to really bring about solid change. Mm. I feel you, my brother. You know? So that's that. That's all that I'm wanting to say. Yo, my brother. Love you, bro. Love, Love you and you, appreciate you guys. You, JP, unknown crew. Continue. And if you need any assistance or want to reach out, bro, phone call away. We are here. You know, we're in this together. Much love, King. But I also understand when um, you want to embrace and grow what you want to grow. That needs to be respected. So, um, in any other aspects, let us align, brother. 100%. Let's focus on the mission that's bigger than us, yeah. not about me or you. 100%. I couldn't agree with you more, bro. Are we? Are we? Are we?
Thank you so much for coming it's on. It's a pleasure, man. Thank you for having me, guys. Deep South Connect. It's Word. all about respect. Yeah. Got so much respect for my brother. Love you, bro. Oh, mentor. Much love, King. Yeah. We'll speak again. I'm yes. sure we're going to do another one again in the future. Maybe oh, yeah. when your next book comes out. Yes, sir. Because you've got a whole wealth of knowledge behind you. And thank you for blessing us still with learning. so much. And still learning. Yeah. Right, so bro. yeah, Deep South Connect is all about respect. Deep South Connect, Keep respect guys. Keep an eye on Cape Flats Karma. It's a series we've been doing with all online. Yeah. Look up Cape. We'll actually plug it. We'll put the link in the description. Nice. I will appreciate so, that. Thank you. Word. Much love, King. I love you, bro. Love you too, Thank you for brother. your time and thank you for Likewise. having me. Thank you cool. for having us. Just Much love. Rule 9, so my love to death is coffin, brain infested like wounds. Now it's rotten, took a death, goes together like sheep and cotton. Number 9, turn around.